Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting of the Adult Social Care and Public Health Committee, which is being held remotely, broadcast live and recorded for publication, with the majority of the 11 members joining the meeting from their own homes. I'm Councillor Tony Harper and I'm chairman of this committee. For the benefit of the viewers of the live stream, I'll now ask the clerk to the committee, Sarah Allman, to list the other members and officers present today. Sarah, please. Thank you, Chairman. The other members present today are Councillors Joyce Bosniak, Dr John Doddy, Boyd Elliott, Sybil Fielding, David Martin, Francis Perdue Horan, Andy Sissons, Steve Vickers, Muriel Weiss and Yvonne Woodhead. As well as myself, we also have the following officers present today. Corporate Director, Adult Social Care and Health, Melanie Brooks. Director for Public Health, Jonathan Gribbin. Service Director, Sue Batty. Service Director, Ainsley McDonnell. Director of Transformation, Grace Natoli. Group Manager, Natalie Burkett. Senior Public Health and Commissioning Manager, Rebecca Atkinson. And Executive Officer, William Brearley. And Senior Executive Officer, Jenny Kennington. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Sarah. We'll move to item one of the agenda, which is the minutes of the last meeting on the 12th of October. Uh, you can find them on pages three to five in your agenda pack. Everyone's had the minutes as a pre-read, so can the minutes be agreed, please? Anyone against? Any abstentions? Thank you, well, I will assume assent. We'll move to item two of the agenda, apologies for absence. Sarah, are there any apologies or substitutions, please? Uh, there are no apologies or substitutions, Chairman. Thank you. We'll move on to item three of the agenda, which is declarations of interest. And again, I'll read this out. Do any members or officers present have any disclosable pecuniary interest to declare? And do any members or officers present have any private interest, pecuniary or non-pecuniary, to declare? Thank you. There are no hands up there. Uh, as I always say at this point, if anyone does find anything that they do have, uh, anything that they that they want to declare, then do it at the time. Wait, wait. When once we get there, it's okay. Just put your hand up, and and we'll declare it then. So we'll now move on to item four on the agenda: Public Health Services Performance and Quality Report for contracts funded with Ring Fence Public Health Grant, 1st of April to 30th of June 2020. And you'll find that on pages 7 to 18 in your agenda pack. So the report provides an overview of performance for public health directly commissioned services and services funded either in whole or in part by the public health grant from April to June this year. A summary of the key performance measures is set out on the first page of Appendix A in your pack. This performance report reflects progress during quarter one over lockdown. The recommendation of the report, as set out on page 14 of the agenda pack, is for committee to scrutinise the performance of services commissioned using the public health grant. To debate it, I'll formally move the recommendation. Do I have a seconder, please? Oh, okay, That's yeah. Councillor Boyd. Thank you. So Natalie Burkett, please, could you introduce your report? Good morning and thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, quarter one was an exceptional time for everyone and very much impacted on the way our providers were able to deliver services. Quarter one, as you'll all be aware, covered the whole of lockdown. During lockdown, some services were deemed to be non-critical and were stopped during this quarter, and these included health checks and weight management services. However, members will see that even then some health checks were done and our integrated wellbeing provider, ABL, posted exercise videos online and also supported the work of the community hub by providing healthy recipes in food parcels. Other services were unable to be provided face to face or unable to use any community venues, including schools, which can be essential for service provision. And these included the C card, integrated wellbeing service, illicit tobacco services and oral health promotion. However, this did not mean that work stopped. All providers continued to provide services either by transferring advice online or preparing for the end of lockdown. Still other providers had staff reallocated to fight the pandemic on the front line, as in the case of our sexual health providers. 
and still others continued not only to provide services such as the Healthy Family Services, but some were overwhelmed by referrals and extra asks of them such as the substance misuse, domestic abuse and homelessness services. The KPIs, therefore, in the spreadsheet cannot begin to reflect the work done by our providers. And to that end, I am looking at different ways to bring this information to committee. Some of it is artic articulated in the narrative, but this is the tip of the iceberg. What I can confirm to committee is that public health officers maintain close communication with all our providers to ensure that safe and effective services were still being delivered as much as the new laws and guidance would allow. I have been overwhelmed by the response of our providers to work flexibly, innovatively, and with the safety and welfare of our residents at that core. I can honestly say that this has been due in no small part to the fact that we have in public health over the years garnered very good supplier relationships and that our procurement practices with the outstanding help of our legal and procurement colleagues has been such that even our new provider, ABL, has been working extraordinarily to overcome the many issues they have faced. Another thing I'd like to add is that those providers who have been able to have contact with service users have been told and have seen for themselves how helpful such contact has been during this time with people's mental well-being. And finally, I would like to add that a number of innovative online practices have come out of having to find new ways of working. And I can assure members that these will not be lost moving forward. I'm always happy and open to take any questions. Thank you, Natalie. Have we got any questions or comments from members, please? I've got Councillor David Martin, please. Morning, everybody. Morning, Natalie. Uh, I welcome the report, obviously, and we know it's been a difficult time. Um, so I'm just going to pick up on a few things that uh, hopefully you'll be able to answer me with um, when I can get my bloody gadget to work. So uh, moving to item 29 of the report, so I'll just briefly read it to you. It's a credit to the provider, uh, their staff safe provision and services contributed through lockdown. This has remained the case, even though CGL has had to deal with significant overcapacity. So Change Grow Lives, a significant contribution to helping uh, drug and alcohol users. It's <coughs> certainly welcome during this period, more than any. Um, According to the Royal College of Physicians, addiction services in England are struggling to cope with the soaring numbers of people misusing alcohol and other opiates. That's why I wholeheartedly back an extra £700,000 in services. The local figures certainly mirror national trends, but I fear that this may well be the tip of the iceberg, like you're saying, really. Latest evidence shows that adults are drinking uh, more since the coronavirus pandemic began. Uh, the college estimates that in June, more than 8.4 million people in England were drinking at higher risk levels, up from 4.8 million in February. So COVID-19 has shown just how stretched and under-resourced this area is. Uh, Ill-equipped addiction services are uh, to treat growing numbers of vulnerable people living with complex illnesses. Drug-related deaths and alcohol-related hospital admissions were already at high time. At high levels before COVID. So it just goes to show that obviously it is the tip of the iceberg and these const constant lockdowns and tier three effects are having a massive impact, impact on that area. And so item 38 and 39, I've got real concerns here, Mr. Chairman, that officers were advised not to raid premises suspected of selling or holding illicit tobacco. Um, I appreciate the safety of officers was paramount during lockdown, but th that advice from the police uh, during lockdown was, in my view, incorrect and exacerbated a clear and present health risk. The illicit tobacco industry undermines efforts to reduce smoking. Illicit tobacco has also been linked to organised crime and even, funding, even to funding terrorism. Putting that to one side, uh, 
you know, children and putting that to one side. Sorry, I've lost my thread there. Councillor Martin, would you like Natalie yes, to, to reply to you first bit while you're looking? Yeah, go on, reply to the first bit. one. Yeah, I've just yeah. deleted, I've just deleted yeah. my email. That's yeah, no, no, no problem. Natalie, are you in a position to explain the police procedures or would uh, the Director of uh, Public Health be in a better position to do that? Well, I mean, I, I was talking to the officers who obviously um, are authority officers who work in the trading standards team. Uh, who do the illicit tobacco services and and at the end of the day they they can only enter premises really with the help of the police and and it was the extraordinary times during that lockdown i'm sure the police had far well i say far far more pressing matters to deal with i know this is a pressing matter in itself but unfortunately not everything could be done and this was one of the things that it was advised to step down. As I've, as I've put in the report though, this did not stop officers continuing to collate the information um, and also preparing um, cases that they'd already taken, taking them to court. So they didn't stop working, but yes, it was. I suppose it was unfortunate in a way, but we can only be guided by the police and we, we can't control what the police advise us. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, the, the, the problem is, Councillor Martin, that, that we can't speak on behalf of another agency. Could I suggest you contact, drop a note to Councillor Purdue Horan, who's on this call, who is the uh, County Council representative on the police and crime panel, and he could raise it directly with the Chief Constable. Yeah, do you, do you think they'll be, start, they'll be resuming that very soon? I, I can't. I can't speak on behalf of another agency, David. Uh, the uh, as I say, if you contact Councillor Purdue Hor, and he'll be able to do it through the County Council channels at the Police and Crime Panel. Uh, is is there anything? Uh, is yeah, the off of your I have one more. Yeah, one more actually. So um, on appendix district level data, uh, the top sheet, the quarter one performance. Uh, can you explain to me why there's 792? total numbers in treatment of adult and children on in Mansfield. It seems to be a lot higher in Mansfield than any other area, it, you know, across the chart. So is there a reason for that? Are they doing something different in that area? Is that, is that, is that why there's more been treated in that area? Or is, that, or is it just a spike in that area? And if so, why is it just Mansfield? Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, Natalie, could you answer that one, please? Yeah, sorry, Councillor Martin. Which which line is so that? The very top, the, um... top line. Total total numbers in treatment of adult and children, and then in bracket brackets you put separate for young people and adults, which I've I've, I've lost the plot. That as clear as the American election that bit. <laughs> that clear. <laughs> um, so because you put total numbers in treatment of adult and children, and then in brackets you put separate for YP and adults. Well, it's a bit of a contradicting statement, so I'm, I'm a bit at a loss as to understand that. But why is the 792 in Mansfield, and the rest of the areas appear lower? Are they doing something different, or is is the data being recorded disproportionately? I can look that. into that for you, Councillor Martin. Um, but what I can say, obviously, is that um, there is uh, there are a, a number of areas of deprivation, and we are very much trying to um, focus our services in those areas of deprivation. But I will look into those for you and um, email you back the reasoning behind it. Yeah, uh, the other thing is as well on the bottom bottom of that same page homelessness so these are really low numbers are, is, is so are we presuming that this is are these 29 percent of six or I, I don't understand the figures on that because it's not very clear natalie is 29 percent is that six is that six people Again, I can look at, sorry, I, I'm unable to bring that up on my screen, so I'm struggling a little bit myself, actually, but I'll have a look at it, and, and if I can email you around that, or even have a conversation with you afterwards, Councillor Martin, if that's acceptable. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I think I think we need a bit more of an explanation on on the assistance that we're giving to homeless people, especially during COVID, um, and the percentages for a three month period, I presume. I know that um, especially during that these three months, um, it was it was tried to put as many rough sleepers into hotels as possible, um, and so they they were put into the hotels and supported there by CGL, for example, um, as well as framework. But I, definitely, I will I will look into that. Um, as I say, I'm struggling because I can't actually get it onto my screen. Um, but yeah, we'll yeah. have a okay. well, I, with you afterwards. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd definitely like to see if that's uh, probably something we should put on the work programme, but I would definitely like to see more detail about that. Going Chair, forward. I, Chair, I wonder if I might just make a comment because I think I, I, I might be able to make a couple of comments which, which would help in that regard. And in terms of the homelessness, um, Natalie's quite right. During um, lockdown, we found that all of the, the normal housing pathways um, were, um, were, were full up of other people who ordinarily would be homeless. And that means that um, it, uh, it became very difficult for anyone to move people on from one form of temporary accommodation into more permanent arrangements. And I think that's what you see reflected in the relatively low percentages. So there's a relatively small proportion of the people who we were able to move on because the spaces in other accommodations simply didn't exist for them. And I think probably what we need to remember is the, the high number of people who ordinarily would have been homeless who were being catered for um, by one statutory agency or another during this period. And that was that was something to celebrate, I think. Yeah, so do you think during COVID that we learned anything about how to deal with homelessness? Um, I'm, I'm sure we did, and some of those arrangements are being followed through on now. Uh, and working with our district and borough council colleagues, who of course are the, the lead agency around housing, um, we're, we're pleased to you know strengthen arrangements for people who are homeless. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I'm homing in on, I'm homing in on it. Chair, if I may, if you may indulge me a moment. I'm homing in on it because obviously uh, single white males between the age of 25 and 54 are the highest suicide risks group and they predominantly are the highest rate of people that end up homeless. So I think it, I think it might be worth having a, um, an extra paper just to see how we deal with that and that transition probably on the work programme at the end. I think I'll, I'll ask for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, we'll get that uh, put on the uh, work programme. Sarah's made a note of that. Thank you, Jonathan, and, and thank you, Natalie. I've now got four speakers left. Councillor John Doddy, Councillor Joyce Bosniak, Councillor Muriel Wise and Councillor Andy Sisson. So, Councillor John Doddy, please. Uh, yeah, thanks very much indeed. Uh, yes, it's a, a very tough quarter uh, for uh, achievements and seeing ourselves get back to the high standards that we would normally expect. Um, in terms of sexually transmitted diseases, we would normally have nearly 50,000 appointments, and I think there was just about 5,000. Prior to the lockdown, there was an increase in gonorrhea of 25 odd percent and syphilis, etc., as we moved into 2020 to begin with anyway. And I, I note that there was an extra 700,000 given to uh, opiates and alcohol, and you could actually make the same case for practically every single public health outcome framework, really, couldn't you? Um, it was a, a surprise, I suppose, that the only thing given priority going into it as critical was smoking. To seem to single out smoking as being critical, but you could have equally wise in retrospect now look at alcohol and look at opiates, etc., as well. In terms of the fact that we were coming into a time of an increase in sexually transmitted diseases, and in terms of the fact that we have probably lost 45,000 appointments that would have picked up those and treated those, there is a, a, a lot of innovation going on out there. It's thought that people have come on in 10 years progress in 10 weeks because necessity is the mother of invention. And there's a huge amount more of distance screening and distance treating. So there's a lot of digital platforms which have taken the place of uh, physical clinics in sexual transmitted diseases around the country. There's an awful lot of home testing which has been driven as well. So um, I'm just 
hoping, uh, as Natalie said at the very beginning, that the early learning can translate into very effective working to help us catch up with the deluge of sexually transmitted diseases that works out there. And have you noticed our platforms and our home screening services that we commission uh, through the providers actually stepping up and doing that? Or is it another area that we will need to put again like 700,000 of opiates and alcohol into driving or are we already stepping up to that mark? Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Councillor Doddy. Natalie, please. Yes, um, even before lockdown, we were utilising online testing services for chlamydia and HIV. Um, and we, ha we are extending that provision because you're quite right, Councillor Doddy, um, those online services are being utilised more and more, which which is good. Um, and um, obviously, we are going to be harnessing that and make definitely making sure that they are utilised in the future. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. Uh, Councillor Joyce Bosniak, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to also ask the question about the illicit tobacco services, uh, but I. I ex I accept your response to that question, and it is a matter for the police, so I won't dwell on that. Uh, I want to say something really positive to Natalie about this report, because we all know, don't we, that when the chips are down, it's, a, it's remarkable how people can get inventive and work together and do far more than they're being asked to do as well. So I actually think that what we need to do from this is learn lots of different things. So it can be something quite positive, turn it into something quite positive. And without having to go through COVID, we may not have even discovered these new ways of working. Because this one about um, on the uh, alcohol and drug misuse, uh, this about mobile phones for people at greatest risk, that's a great idea. I wouldn't have thought about that. And having these Zoom sessions, I know we all moan and groan about Zoom sessions, uh, but they can be really effective. So I was really pleased to see that. And um, then, but I also want to just say again that I agree that now we've seen, uh, and I speak, hold my hand up and say I do drink more than I used to drink before, um, that we do really need to invest that money uh, in opiates and, and alcohol treatment, really, because that has been a real eye opener. And it just goes to show that when people aren't going into work, and in the afternoon, probably about four o'clock time, when they're starting to get a bit bored, don't know what else to do, they reach for the wine in the fridge. So I do think uh, there's some really positive things out of this. There's some lessons to be learned. And, I, and like Councillor Doddy said, I think we might need to look again at finding extra money because problems have come to the fore that perhaps weren't. Got. It's COVID has caused some of these ongoing addictions that perhaps we haven't considered before, as sexual activity, no less. So thanks, Natalie. It's nice to say something really positive about your report. Thank you very much, Councillor Bosniak. And I fully agree with everything you say, but particularly the mobiles, which is a really good idea for peeping, people keep, keep in touch with them. So thank you very much. Natalie, do, would you like to make any comment on that? Just to say, obviously, I absolutely agree with um, what Councillor Bosniak has said. And, and I can assure committee that we are capturing all good practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Muriel Wise, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, morning, Natalie. Uh, a question about um, the, the domestic abuse services. I mean, it looks, re it looks really encouraging that the outcomes um, that were set are being met well. Uh, I'm just wondering, it, it talks about um, the teams giving support through the courts, which again seems to work very well. It just seems at the moment that because of the court situation, um, in the are you finding that in the community, um, women particularly are struggling to um, uh, be sure that the access arrangements. Um, the contact arrangements are being kept to by their partners. I seem to be coming across a few where um, there's a high level of anxiety about one partner keeping the children and not allowing access because of uh, 
uh, COVID arrangements and uh, the women, which is mainly women, are struggling to get cases back to court, which is the advice they're being given by uh, Juno and so on. I know we can't transform the court situation. I just wondered if, if there's any particular focus on uh, providing support for those situations. And then the other question, I don't know whether it's relevant for yourself or not. On the radio this morning, there was a national report that during COVID, people with disabilities have uh, uh, found it difficult to access the services that they would normally access. Um, and I wonder, just on a broad front, whether that is a concern from yourselves in public health. OK, if I can answer your first query, um, I'm afraid that um, you know, contact arrangements in itself is can be a form of control, of course, um, and and it and it is um, you know trying to get court court appointments in let's say normal times um, sometimes can be a difficulty, and obviously this has been exacerbated greatly during COVID as courts have um, slowed down the the amount of time that they're actually sitting. I can assure you that our providers are doing all they can to assist these women and will continue to do so. Um, in respect to people with disabilities, the only, the only thing I can add is that some of the online, new online services that we have provided um, may have been of assistance to some people with disabilities, but obviously we continue um, to ensure that all our services are open to people with all types of disabilities. And uh, we do check on that in our, in our we have surveys of, of the characteristics of the people that our services provide, our providers give services to. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you um, You appear to have new, been muted, Natalie. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, can hear you yeah. now, no problem. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, I've got bad network quality coming up on my screen. I do apologise. Yes, I'm afraid I can't um, give any statistics about people with disabilities ac having difficulty accessing services during COVID. No, that's fair enough. That Thank you, Natalie. Could, could, could I just bring just in Rebecca back. Atchinson? Because I think she might be wanting to answer your question, Muriel. Rebecca okay. Atchinson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, Councillor Wise. Um, I'm Rebecca Atchinson. I'm the uh, Senior Public Health Commissioning Manager for Domestic Abuse Services. So I thought I'd just answer the question that you had around domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. um, what we have found, um, and then Natalie has quite rightly already shared, is that as um, we've entered the first lockdown, there were some real challenges for uh, domestic abuse survivors uh, regarding child contact. Um, this was particularly difficult for um, survivors who were finding that they were being threatened more readily by, um, by perpetrators um, regarding contact issues. And that, that was a real, real issue. And as, as you've rightly pointed out, the court arrangements has be, have been additionally challenging because we found that there's been significant delays within court arrangements and that has created a lot of stress and upset for survivors across Nottinghamshire. Our domestic abuse services have worked very closely with survivors and they are helping survivors to um, navigate their way through those um, services and the court procedures as we speak. But this is a long-term problem that we're going to be experiencing over the next probably 12, 12 to 18 months. I've heard reports that it will take about 18 months for the courts to get back to the state that they were in prior to lockdown. So we all we can do with our services is to support survivors, um, but we are um, working alongside um, partners like the Police and Crime Commissioner to make sure that they are aware of the challenges that our service users are experiencing. Thank you, Rebecca. Councillor Wise? Can just, sorry, yes. So what, what advice should um, I be giving to women in this situation? Because they in contact with Juno and MASH, 
the answer has been that it really can only be resolved through the courts and the, and the time is, is slipping. Is Equation a separate online support or do people go through Juno to access Equation? So um, Juno is one of our support services yeah. for women. Yeah. Um, Equation is a support service for men. All oh, right. OK. So, and so. Equation also do our prevention, promotion and training um, services. So they are providing training for staff. They're also providing nice. work with um, with children and young people, uh, ensuring that they have a better understanding of the risks and challenges around domestic abuse. Um, but our and they also provide some work with young men. OK, so the route is through uh, folk in the south. It's still through Juno. Yes, it will be through Juno, and in the north of the county, it will be through Knotts Women's Aid. Yeah, sure. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Andy Sissons, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I was equally shocked by the numbers uh, of substance misuse people under treatment for Mansfield. Uh, it makes you wonder how many people who aren't taking treatment are out there. Uh, Mansfield must be the worst place in the district for it. Um, I, I would just like Natalie to send me some in information on the, on those figures as well, please, Chairman, if that's all right. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine, Councillor Sissons. Uh, but uh, as I always ask in this committee, uh, could, could you send it to all the members of the committee, please, as well as just Councillor Sissons? Thank you. Uh, there are no more questions. I'll uh, move to the vote. Uh, in order to make the voting clear for each agenda item, I'll ask Sarah to read out members' names alphabetically in order for them to confirm whether they're voting for or against the recommendation or indeed abstaining. Sarah, please. Thank you, Chairman. So please note that the votes today will not be recorded in the minutes of the meeting unless two or more members request it in line with the usual recorded vote arrangements. Um, so I'll call members' names in turn if you can say whether you're voting for, against or abstaining. Councillor Bosniak. Four. Councillor Doddy. Councillor Doddy. I'll come back to Councillor Doddy. Councillor Elliott. Four. Councillor Fielding. Four. Councillor Harper. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Purdue Horan. Four. Councillor Sissons. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Councillor Weiss. Four. Councillor Woodhead. Four. And I'll just come back to Councillor Doddy. OK, well, uh, um, that's unanimously otherwise, so uh, that's carried, Chairman. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item five on the agenda, which is the local COVID-19 outbreak response and public health priorities for the period to April 2021, which you'll find on pages 19 to 24 of your agenda pack. So the COVID-19 situation is evolving and we now find ourselves in further challenging times as we enter the winter season. The escalation of the response to the pandemic has prompted a review of priorities for the period ahead through to spring 2021. And I've asked the corporate director and and Director of Public Health to update members on the departmental strategy in light of this review. So I'll move the recommendations of the report as set out on page 22 of the agenda pack, uh, which are approve the prioritisation of work within Public Health Division and approve the establishment of one full-time equivalent consultant in Public Health on a permanent basis. Do I have a seconder, please? Yeah, Councillor Purdue Horan, thank you very much. Uh, do, Corporate Director Melanie Brooks and Director of Public Health, Jonathan Gribbin, over to you, please. I believe it's Jonathan first. Good morning, councillors. I'm pleased to bring you a bit of an update uh, around um, the situation uh, that we find across Nottinghamshire and uh, in terms of coronavirus. And if I may, I'm going to do that by um, taking you through a few slides. The format of the slides will be um, starting to become familiar to to a number of you now. Uh, I'm hoping that um, chair, can I just check? Could you nod for me if that if that's on your screen? Great. Um, so um, I'm going to 
share with you first of all uh, um, some of the rates right across Nottinghamshire. Let's see if I can make the screen larger. Uh, no, it doesn't want to do that, so I'm just going to stick with what we've got there. I'm hoping that it's legible for you. Um, you can see there a table which shows by district and borough um, the rates per 100,000 uh, across the whole of the county. The, um, the two columns I'm going to focus on are towards the right hand side of the of the chart uh, of the table. Um, four columns from the right hand side, we find the case uh, the, the rate uh, for all ages. And uh, I think probably the main thing to note here is that wherever you look in Nottinghamshire, all of these rates are very high. So we can compare one area with another and we can note that Bassett Law is highest and has seen a lot of increases and now stands at 451. But even if we were to look at the um, at the district which has the lowest rate, Newark and Sherwood, 251, that too represents a very high rate. What is also of concern to us, of course, is the rate in, in particular amongst people who are aged 60 or over. And uh, again, we see right across the county uh, rates which are, are far too high, too high in the sense that it's rates particularly in this age group that are driving some of the pressures that Melanie will tell us about in a moment or two. And that if we were asking NHS colleagues, they would um, tell us are driving some of the pressures they're experiencing, particularly in hospitals, but not only in hospitals, in primary care as well. You'll be able to see over in the right, the far right hand column here, the percentages here, and that's uh, that's showing by how much these rates amongst over 60s have changed in the, over the last week. And you'll um, you'll be able to see that in some parts of the county, they're relatively flat. There's been a just a small increase or a very small decrease, but it's quite notable that in Bassett Law and in Ashfield in particular, we've seen um, some very sharp increases. So moving on and looking um, at then at uh, those rates amongst over 60s, this is bundling together the whole of Nottinghamshire County together. So there's no distinction between one district or borough and another here. What we've got is a different coloured line uh, for different age groups. The brown line, uh, well, red, sort of red brick brown line, which you I'm afraid is somewhat hidden, is the over 60s rate. The other um, the other colours show the rates for 60s to 69, 70 to 79, 80 to 89 year olds and people who are over 90. That the brown line in the middle here, you'll see that it was rising very sharply through um, the middle of last month and towards the end of the month, it flattened out. And for the last 10 days or so, has been relatively flat. There's a slight increase in that line. So that's the picture that we see overall across the whole of the county in terms of over 60s. If I may, I'm going to whip through now um, quite quickly um, a few charts which show how the picture varies from one part of the county to another. And I'm going to do that by bringing up on the screen um, some charts which um, are uh, very small to discern, but I'm going to I'm flagging. I'm wanting to highlight to you the bottom left hand chart, which again shows the rate amongst over 60s in this brown line here. So I'm showing you here the picture for Bassett Law, and you can see that although in some areas of the county the um, the rate has flattened off in Bassett Law, in amongst over 60s, and indeed amongst people of any age the rate continues to climb pretty steeply. And that's a, a real concern to us because, as I said, that will be driving some of the pressures that we see in the health and in the care system. In Mansfield as well, although we see a um, uh, bottom left hand corner again, um, uh, we see a slightly um, mixed picture, but overall it seems to have been increasing. There's a possibility over the last few days that that's levelling out, but probably too early to call that a trend. In Ashfield, again, a similar picture again. It's probably flatter now than it was two or three weeks ago when we saw a very steep rise in the middle of October. Nevertheless, it hasn't yet levelled out and certainly hasn't turned around. In Broxtow, however, moving to the, um, the south of the county, um, we see that amongst over 60s, the rate has flattened out. And in fact, over the last 10 days or so, if anything, there's been a very slight drop. So that's um, a note of encouragement to sound. Similarly, in Rushcliffe, we've also, amongst over 60s, seen things flattening out over the last two or three weeks. 
we need to see um, that reversed. We want to turn that into a reduction. Nevertheless, it's um, it's uh, promising that at least it's not been continuing to rise at the very sharp rate that we saw in the middle of last month. Gedling, we see a similar picture again, um, pretty flat over the last two or three weeks. Newark and Sherwood that I'll um, come to last, slightly different picture here. Newark and Sherwood um, uh, uh, was uh, had enjoyed lower rates than much of the rest of the county um, through October. We saw increases there towards the end of last month, including amongst over 60s. Uh, and it's probably a bit too early to call uh, as a definite trend, but there's a possibility here showing that actually we might be seeing a decrease uh, and, and uh, rates amongst over 60s heading the, the right way. So I think uh, there's more detail I could share, uh, Chair, but I think, um, at this point, I'll probably um, hand back to, to Melanie because um, it's it's not just the rates we need to comment on. It's actually the impact in the health and in the care system. And I know Melanie's got an update around the care system. And uh, if she doesn't cover it, I can add a note or two about how things stand in our local hospitals. Um, over to you, Melanie. OK, so what I want to give the committee a flavour of, as Jonathan said, is the impact. Um, so. I'm sure you will have seen nationally um, the profile of hospital admissions that we're starting to see in the south because NUH have been very public about that. But we're also seeing pressure across the other hospitals in the county as well. It's not just a pressure in the south. And indeed, as the rates are increasing around the county, it's no surprise that that's translating into admissions. The over 80s line, I think, and the over 60s line is given particular concern for adult social care. So at the same time as we're seeing the rates increase, we're seeing the numbers of care home outbreaks increase. And care homes I'll take loosely to mean either a registered care home or a place of accommodation based support that we support somebody receiving social care. So that could include supported accommodation or extra care, but for, you know, for ease, I'm going to use the term care home. So currently we have around what we would call 70 at risk settings. So that includes um, as of Friday, 52 care homes experiencing an outbreak, a number of services that have received an exposure. There's different language here, um, so, so bear with me, um, and other settings that have got a, a, an outbreak. So there are 70 places that, that give us concern that are requiring a specific plan. So for each specific plan, we mobilise um, a team that includes adult social care quality staff, public health staff, infection control staff from health and with regional support from Public Health England. So if you can imagine, that's quite a resource intensive process. So I'm just flagging that point because it will relate to Jonathan's report in item five, um, as well as giving us big concern about the number of residents affected. Out of that whole sum, though, um, not all of that will translate into residents or people living in the setting becoming unwell. So we have nine of those which we're considering to be significant outbreaks where we have concerns about large number of residents. So an outbreak by definition is where you have two or more staff testing positive. And some of that, as you've heard from me before, is because of testing and asymptomatic testing. But what we are seeing, like I say, is it's increased 10% every day in the last seven days is the pattern we're seeing. So significant concern across the um, the care market. Um, so I think this impacts us in, in a number of ways. The first is about availability of staff. So at the moment, social care staff availability is somewhere between 70 and 80 percent dependent on the service. So that means that services are running below capacity, which means that we're um, significantly strained in our available capacity to support. So if you have an outbreak, that service is completely shut down. It can't take new people. Um, so the available capacity is those that don't have an outbreak and they also have capacity concerns in staff. Um, so if, if you like, there's great risk across um, the social care market and that will in turn impact on our ability to support the hospitals, um, both in terms of preventing people going in because of our ability to support people in their usual setting, as well as supporting people to come out of hospital once they've completed their admission and treatment. So really, I just want to give that bit of a flavour for the impact. So we are expecting there to be um, an impact on transmission rates of the new restrictions. But as Jonathan will tell you, that takes time um, to continue. And what we're seeing now is a pressure from some two to three weeks ago. So I'm not expecting that pressure to ease for another one to two weeks if we take that working assumption that we haven't seen the worst of it yet. So I'm expecting those trends to continue. Um, in terms of our readiness, 
uh, we have stood back up our emergency planning um, to, to much more frequently and we've got some urgent actions in place from Friday over the weekend and today to resource some critical areas. So the main priority for me is about resourcing um, public health and quality market management to support the care sector. So that's of crucial importance in terms of outbreak management. The second is to be looking at our redeployment pool to be supporting um, care, so direct care to people given the capacity constraints. So that's my focus of today. Thank you, Melanie. Um, um, so I've got the next, just the yep. next slide, um, Tony. So, Jenny, if you don't mind moving me on. Um, so, the the other thing just to mention is about the care home guidance. So we have had new national guidance. Um, we did push hard for some greater clarity about balancing uh, rights and well-being with infection control. But clearly, the context in Nottinghamshire is quite significant at the moment. We are going to be working. Um, on this and be producing some guidance that's suitable um, and we're going to be making sure that's got some regional alignment so we will be communicating that out um, as soon as we're able to but clearly our focus today is about managing the outbreaks rather than thinking about supporting um, visiting at this time but we will be in making sure that guidance is implemented and I think the last thing I just wanted to know is that Jonathan and I are acutely aware of the growing inequalities and the impact of um, COVID and non-COVID harm. So we also know the restrictions on um, work life, personal life have consequences and committees heard about some of those already today. We're acutely aware of that, but I think it's just to, to frame that in the fact that we're in this response mode. So our immediate priority is making sure that people are safe from the, the impact of that COVID harm is having. Um, so I think it's just to give committee that flavour before we consider Jonathan's report on how we're going to resource and manage that from a public health perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for that interesting update. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to introduce your report now, please? Certainly, I can I can uh, go ahead with that. So we're looking at item five now, and uh, we're looking at um, the response to COVID-19 and also our priorities for the, the period ahead. And paragraph six really um, uh, describes the context for that, which is broadly what you've heard already. And I think really the expectation that um, some form of measures and ongoing outbreak management are likely to be needed well through to the spring. Now, that's not to say that the current lockdown measures, nor even any one level of tiering or another, will be in place in December, January, February, but some form of outbreak management will continue to be needed. So um, I will continue to need to deploy uh, colleagues to staff the um, the inbox, which uh, answers queries and addresses queries from um, around the county from many different services. We'll be continuing to need to stand up incident management teams and outbreak cells uh, periodically. PPE, although it's in a completely different place to what it was last uh, uh, last spring, um, continues to need attention from us to make sure that services have what they need. We'll continue to need to work closely with environmental health around their powers uh, and uh, in enforcement with care homes. As Melanie said, uh, we'll continue to work with secondary care in particular around some of their outbreaks with schools. We continue to need to support the work around testing locally, around contact tracing to strengthen that, around the data and analytics that I was sharing with you a little while ago. There'll be uh, a strengthened and increasing effort, I think, going on uh, again around um, making sure that vulnerable people receive the kind of support that they need. And of course, we continue to need to work with our universities and in our prisons, which have also seen outbreaks. So this and other work um, is, is very much taking the attention of colleagues like Rebecca, who you've heard from already and we'll be hearing from in a minute or two around domestic abuse, notwithstanding the importance of agendas like that. Um, we're struggling to keep everything that we regard would normally regard as important going. And so this paper sets out um, in the first instance some of the things which we in paragraph nine will continue to um, uh, to prioritize uh, because they're absolutely essential. And that would include some of the things we've touched on already around substance misuse treatment services, sexual health services, our integrated well-being services, what we do for naught to nine teens. Um, what we do around domestic violence and so on. But uh, in paragraph 10, we set out a number of things which we're either going to have to stop or to pause for some months now um, while we give our attention um, to um, 
to the COVID response, and indeed not just the COVID response, but also some attention as well to sustaining um, my team, who uh, many of whom are are weary um, six or eight months now into this, as are many people across um, right across our population, across all of our residents, and indeed across the the county council as well. So that's the um, the first half of this paper. The second half um, picks up um, a much more specific request around a staffing uh, proposal. Casting your minds back to September, you may remember that uh, you gave a committee gave approval at that point to recruiting to some fixed term posts, and we've had some success with a number of those, and I'm really pleased uh, to have filled some of those positions already. One of the ones that we weren't uh, that was very important to us, but that we were unable to fill, was a fixed term consultant in public health post. And um, it, frankly, it's not an enormous surprise um, in the current climate. Um, people like this um, are harder to come by. What we'd like to do and are now underway with is seeing if we can recruit to a permanent position, because of course, a permanent position is likely to be much more attractive uh, in the market than uh, the one is simply fixed term. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, and so we're seeking um, your approval there for a permanent consultant in public health position which for the first six 12 months in all likelihood will be focused exclusively around the local outbreak management thereafter would pick up a range of responsibilities covering each of the three public health domains so very much same sort of pattern and mix of work as our other consultants pick up and as you'll be hearing there's no shortage of additional new work coming along and the next item item six will will touch on some additional work that's likely to be coming our way over the long term um, that's all i wanted to say by way of introduction chair Thank you, Jonathan, and all of this committee is fully behind your staff and the work they do, and we know that they're putting in extra work as as have the adult social side. Uh, they've done an amazing job, so please pass on this committee's thanks to all of your staff. We know, we know they're getting weary, uh, but the work just piles up, so uh, well done for, for coping with what, what you've managed to do. Uh, do any members have any comments or questions, please? Right, I've got Councillor David Martin, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to reiterate what you just said there, because um, obviously it's a very testing time, and in no way are we here to criticise uh, the, the good work of the staff. And I've spoken to NHS staff and carers alike over Ashfield, of the district of Ashfield, in the last month, and their resilience to the the conditions and the the time that they're going through is absolutely amazing. Um, they're just getting on with it, and I'll ask them all in turn carers and NH staff alike, whether they are getting the correct amount of PPE, whether they feel safe at work, and they all wholeheartedly do. Mixing that with the apathy of the public um, and the various changing restrictions, I'd, I'd just like to pick up on one point from your analytics and your data, Jonathan, there. Um, it, seems, it appears to me there that the, um, the tier system looked like it was beginning to work then because in the districts that were in the tier three or tier two to start with, there are lower rates. So maybe you could probably answer that one for me later. Obviously, parts of the report are out of date because the government's decision to send us into national lockdown changes the, the data. Um, if national lockdown is lifted on Wednesday, do we expect the areas to go back into tier three, tier two? Um, what discussions have we had with government about um, measures after the lockdown is lifted, because you've just alluded to the fact there that we may not be in any structured lockdown or tier system. So I've been following very carefully the testing pilot in Liverpool, which is quite interesting, where residents have been offered regular tests regardless of whether they display symptoms. Do you, uh, do you think that this is the right thing to do here in Nottinghamshire, looking at Ashfield's and Bassett Law? Do you believe in testing asymptomatic people goes against the advice from the scientific advisory group for emergencies to prioritise tests for those displaying symptoms? Would you like to see this extended to Nottinghamshire, where NHS and teaching staff in particular can't get regular tests? You know, so a bit, bit, I'd like to know a bit more about where, 
I'm not decrying anything anybody's doing. I think we're all you're all doing a fantastic job and it's all going well. But what I'm looking at is where do we go from here? When when we come out of this lockdown, what kind of structure are we going to be left dealing with? Thank you, Councillor Martin. Jonathan, I don't know if you've got all of those questions. You might have to go back to Councillor Martin, but over to you. Um, thank you, Councillor Martin. I, I can I can answer some of them at least. Um, so I think that the um, the what we're seeing happening in Nottinghamshire County specifically, I think, indicates that the the the, the measures that were in place back in October did have some impact. Um, and I think the situation would now be considerably worse if we'd not gone into uh, brought in those those measures, tier two and tier three, notwithstanding that um, we would have been pleased to have seen some of them come in faster. Um, I, I think the, the focus for the next three weeks or so while we're in national lockdown needs to be on making sure that, that all of us right across the county stick with those restrictions. It is onerous, it's, uh, it's, it's tiring and uh, difficult for, for all of our residents, but I, I do believe it will stand us in the best chance of seeing our way through, through Christmas and, and into the winter. Um, in terms of, uh, you, you asked for some comments, or you made some observations and asked for my comments about the, the pilot that we see in Liverpool and uh, what I, the way I see testing going. Um, I should perhaps say, um, so we need to, I think we probably need to, to focus first of all on making sure that arrangements to test people who are symptomatic are working really well and not only in terms of testing but in terms of the contact tracing and the isolation on the back of that. So we know that there have, in, uh, going back several weeks ago, been problems around capacity. We do know that even those who receive a positive result are not always followed up um, well enough in terms of the contact tracing. Uh, we're putting arrangements in place locally to try and strengthen some of that. And of course, um, even that on its own isn't really sufficient because it's if you have a positive result, it's it's isolating and breaking the chain of transmission, which is really important. Um, so all of that needs um, needs strengthening, and there's things that we can do locally. So that's very much about people who are who who are sim a, sorry who are symptomatic. We've got to get it right for people who are symptomatic. As we have more capacity and as different testing technologies come on stream, there may also be a role for uh, more wide scale testing of people who are asymptomatic. Um, uh, and that is what is being part of what is being tested out in Liverpool at the moment. So you asked me what I'd like to see. I suppose I would like to see um, a pilot like that um, brought to completion and to understand the lessons from it. In the meantime, I am rather cautious about um, mass testing of people who are asymptomatic. It's not to say that it won't have a role in the future, but right now we've struggled until very recently, even with capacity to pe test people who are symptomatic. And secondarily, there are some considerations around uh, if you're going to test the whole population, how many false, um, how many false positives you end up with. So in other words, how many people get a f get a positive result when in fact they don't have coronavirus? That's not because the test is poor. The test is very performs very well. But when you start rolling it out across a population where most people don't have the disease, it throws up this phenomenon where you get an awful lot of false positives. Now, if we think back to what Melanie was telling us just a few minutes ago about some of the pressures in the care system around people having to go off work and isolate because they've got a positive test result. We need to be very careful that we don't exacerbate that. So I'm rather cautious about mass testing of asymptomatic people. I think it will have a role in the future, but let's just take it a step at a time. That's probably enough from me, Chair, on that. Thank you very much, Councillor Martin. Can I just ask, where do you think, where do you see us at the end of the break, the national lockdown? Where do you see us there? Do you see us in a, a tiered structure or free for all or, or what? What's the plan? If I may, um, Councillor Harper, so, so um, I know that um, the engagement board through the leader and Anthony May have had 
ongoing conversations with the regional lead um, from government to give feedback about that. But I don't believe that's un that's well understood at a national level. So once I think once that's understood, it'll be the engagement board that will be taking forward that work about the de-escalation. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker I've got is Councillor Muriel Wise, please. Oh, thank you. You've muted As again. Being said, you, you both, um, you, you stay so calm in all this extraordinary challenges. I'm just, uh, I just uh, I think you, you're very impressive. I've got a, a small question, really. Um, there was some mention about exempted groups of people that could have um, direct contact. And I was very glad to see in that the inclusion of new parents. I've heard quite a bit about um, new parents really struggling, um, all the kind of anxieties that uh, normally arise um, in, the, in the early weeks have been exacerbated <coughs> by isolation. And um, <clears throat> one or two cases where there's been queries over um, some aspect of the baby's health, um, the parents haven't been able to get they've waited in one or two cases almost six months to get the scans and investigations that they were waiting for. So clearly there's a high level of anxiety. I just wondered, um, in terms of groups, is there any mileage in um, having a, a group meetings for those new parents so that uh, while they're in a, in a, at a district level or whatever, um, it seems to be the isolation, uh, even if they're in touch with health visitors and so on, that seems to be the major, major problem. Um, yeah, that's the only question I've got. Thank yeah, you. Th thank you, Muriel. Councillor Doddy, please. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Gribbin, please. OK, thank you. Um, thank you for the, the question, Councillor Wise. Um, so there's a couple of things uh, I think I'd want to say to answer your your, your very specific question, um, you're right that um, there are exemptions for um, groups and support groups that are meeting or that ordinarily would wish to meet, some of which now have uh, cannot meet for this month dur uh, during lockdown, but there is an exemption, you're right, for, for new parents. And I think it is to exactly to address um, some of the, the, the concerns that you've highlighted. And of course, it's worth remembering as well that um, a parent with a with a preschooler is able to meet up with another parent with a preschooler. The the the, um, the restrictions around um, uh, isolation uh, are slightly more relaxed for for a, a, a someone who's a primary carer for for a little one. Um, the other point I wanted to make is not notwithstanding the extreme pressure that the local NHS is under, and I'm. And we do know that there will be additional weights for some things. It is worth me underlining in committee that the NHS has made, has had several months and has used that time well to make really good preparations for this second wave. And that does mean that we can reassure all of our residents that the NHS locally remains open for business and that if any of us have any um, symptoms that we're concerned about, we can we can check those out through 111. And if any of us, it turns out, need uh, diagnosis or treatment, there are good arrangements in our local NHS for doing that effectively and and safely. So, notwithstanding some of the disruption that it, it, that is inevitable, it's really important that all of our residents know that no one should hang back from from coming forward if they've got something that they are concerned ab about. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that Muriel. You muted Muriel. I, and it's probably an unfair question, really. I just wondered if there is consistency on the on the on, be, on the side of health visitors to uh, encourage uh, two or three women to meet if they pick up that they are particularly isolated. But it just seems to be a bit in. Yeah, I'm not aware that there's been an encouragement to meet up. Jonathan? Um, 
councillors, I'll, I'll need to take that one away and uh, and and check up with my colleagues who who link in with our um, commission services um, for for health visitors. I'll come back to you on oh, that if I may. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Joyce Bosniak. You did have your hand up. Have you now taken it down? Uh, no, I didn't yep. realise it had come down. Somebody's That's all right, no problem. Taking it, someone's taken it down for me. Uh, right, it's uh, it's paragraph six. It's the top of page twenty, and uh, third bullet point. It says new opportunities for strengthening local control through enforcement and problems uh, to do with NHS test and trace. Given that test and tracing is so crucial to us getting uh, any real angle on this, uh, handle on this, I just wonder how we're doing that, uh, because I'm not quite sure what we can do locally, and I'm not quite sure what you mean by local control through enforcement. So that's one question. And then the other, I think more of a comment really, is that Although we are uh, responding to the pandemic, so it's almost like firefighting at the minute, I'm sure, in fact, I know you've got this, you Melanie, have got this covered. It is having one eye on what is working currently, what isn't working very well, how we would change if we, when it does finish, when it, when it finishes, and we go in, we have the possibility of going to either three again with some little amendments, you can utilize this time to decide what is actually required. So, so I'm confident that you'll use all of your learning to get something specifically uh, for Nottinghamshire that will work. Uh, but my real question is about the control through enforcement, for tra tra track and trace. Thank you, Joyce. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Jonathan pick up the answers, but if I might, it's just, we, we do have a departmental report going to Improvement and Change Subcommittee. That's just um, updating on the progress we have made against departmental strategy, because there has been some, and we did start to stand things back up when we went into recovery. But then what it also does is talk about things as a department will be focusing on at the point we're able to. So it's just to sort of flag that to committee that that report will be covering that point, Joyce. So um, the, your questions about um, test and trace, uh, let me give you a couple of specific examples then. First of all, on the testing side, um, over the next week or so, we're planning to uh, run a very short and small scale pilot, um, probably in one of the southern boroughs, which will, which will uh, be an opportunity to try out um, doorstep or what some people have called backpack testing so this is this is people this is individuals and in our case we're hoping to use volunteers from voluntary sector to go out to deliver tests uh, on the doorstep to households who who need it and then to go back later in the day to collect those those samples and then get them sent off and back into the proper NHS test and trace uh, system. Now that's just sort of one example of one of the things that we're wanting to do locally that will strengthen the, the if you like the, the the penetration or the access um, to to testing within a local community. It's not because we need to deploy that today, but we want to be in a better place next time we get an outbreak in I don't know let's say Broxstow. We want to be in a in a better position to be able to reach right into communities. Uh, and to do that really effectively. So that was testing. On the contact tracing side, we're uh, also going uh, back a few weeks or so ago now, we started to take on responsibility for some of what um, the NHS test and trace system had been doing. So they, um, when they receive information about a positive uh, result, they uh, will try contacting that person to do contact tracing to identify who the contacts are. If they're unable to identify, uh, sorry, if they're unable to make contact with the case, then that information is now being passed on to us locally. And our own customer service centre has been starting to pick that up and have some modest success with that so far. We're seeking to, to build on that over the next few months and we may strengthen that again by adding in potentially a, a doorstop element to that as well. So a welfare visit from someone to go around to, to someone's house where you know that someone has tested positive, A, to check that they're okay, but also then 
um, to see if you can engage in the discussion around the contact tracing to make sure that the contacts are properly identified. So there are a number of things like this that we're just underway with, and that's the kind of thing I think uh, was seeking to, to flag up under that bullet point. Thank you very much. We now have Councillor Sybil Fielding and Councillor John Doddy. We're running a little bit short of time on this item, so if we can ask the questions together. So Councillor Sybil Fielding first, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first, it was to uh, commend the work that's been done in support of care homes within the area I, I represent. And, uh, uh, and as I say, and, and I, I look forward to uh, the advice uh, and, and guidance on, on the care home visits uh, as it comes forward. Uh, the other was to perhaps ask why, uh, why do we do you think there's such a huge spike in, in Bassett Law over the over 60, 60 65s? That was all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fielding. Councillor Doddy, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, indeed. I, I, I'd just like to reiterate uh, at the, the outset that this second wave on the ground in Brookstow certainly feels a lot more uh, uh, heavy work and a lot more intense than the first wave in that I'm seeing more over 80s admitting more people to hospital, have more GPs so ill, have more receptionists so ill, and the challenge is very real indeed uh, today and on the ground in, in Brookstow and Nottinghamshire. So you can uh, understand the need to do what we've done through public health, etc., and to remain vigilant in, in, in that sense. Uh, but you often see the headline figures of the deaths and the hospital admissions, but there is a terrible toll on the workforce out there. So when one person goes off, the other person is doing the work of two people. It, it really is a genuine challenge. I think that the question I would say, and, and particularly around the idea that we're getting a new public health uh, uh, consultant soon is the fact that we are putting a lot more people to work at home. I see on a daily basis the effect of that. Working from home is that dangerous that it should be classified as a disease. The amount of people who are working from home who are smoking more, if you do not work in an environment where there's any control, you can go out and have a cigarette in your back garden, but you don't have that facility at work. Number two, the amount of mental health problems. Number three, the obesity related problems, the biomechanical problems of people lying in their beds on their uh, computers doing their day's work. Ergonomics, the amount of people at kitchen tables who are doing eight hours on a computer, the sheer physical tool. And I would like to see the new consultant have a responsibility, a bit like we did back, Joyce, with the declaration for tobacco. We need the declaration for safe work at home because it is not a novelty to spend your life walking around in your slippers, not a novelty to lie in the settee doing your work all day. There has to be some form of uh, looking at safety. It's not about whether the office can get the same work done. It's about what is this impact on the health of the person that we are sticking at home. You've had Deloitte close down their offices in Nottingham and 160 people will forevermore work from home. These are actually real decisions which will survive long before COVID. This is not something that will reverse itself because people have found it's economical to keep people at home. And what I'm saying is that a long time ago, nobody ever thought of putting obesity on the list of things that killed people. And now it's at number five on the mortality list in the UK. Nobody would have thought about putting these things on death certificates. But I think that this mass home working should have a workforce directive which looks at the health of people working from home, have a health declaration of the minimum support that we require, education, uh, ergonomics, uh, health-wise, and restrictions that apply to you when you're working in your own home. And I think that you're bringing in a new consultant, and that would be one of the first questions I would say. This is a long-term health-related problem, which will start to appear on disease registers working from home. Uh, I would hope you would agree with that, Jonathan. 
Thank you, Councillor Doddy. Some really pertinent points there. I've actually got the Corporate Director, Melanie Brooks, wanting to come in. Melanie, please. Yep, just before Jonathan answers the, the specific public health related questions, I just wanted to give committee some assurance that the County Council um, has got a workforce stream in both the COVID response and in the recovery planning when we were doing um, recovery planning back in September. And that includes um, the well-being of our workforce. What it doesn't do, Councillor Doddy, is address the workforce well-being of the county as a whole. So, you know, not in sure as a whole, but it certainly starts to look at that. So, and that includes um, how we're, we're working at home safely. But, but I think you're right. There is something about compliance that is more difficult. Um, and I, I know that I'm guilty of that myself, knowing what I should do and then doing it at home is a different matter. But certainly it's something that as a county council, we're taking particularly seriously. And as a department, we've invested quite a bit of time in making sure people understand how to access the mental health first aiders, the wellbeing support, the counselling service, and all of that support has been increased. We've increased the, um, the capacity of those services. So something we're taking particularly seriously but it won't address the population health management concern that you raised. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, could you start off with Councillor Fielding's question first, please, and then move on to Councillor Doddy's. Yes, thank you. And I'm so glad now I made a note of it. Uh, uh, so, Councillor Fielding, well, the honest answer is no, I don't know why the spike right now, but let me make a couple of other uh, other observations. Um, I think that um, we, we shouldn't imagine that there is anywhere in, well, there's nowhere in Nottinghamshire, and, and, it, and probably it applies much more generally across the country, where we can define ourselves a little island and imagine that with high or increasing rates around it, that it, 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 can, it can somehow get by um, and, and keep low rates. So Bassett Law, uh, just as recently as you know, four or six weeks ago, enjoyed relatively low rates compared with other parts of Nottinghamshire. But that can't be sustained. When you look to the north, into South Yorkshire, they've had very high rates there. In Bolsover, they've also got rates pretty, pretty much the same level as in Bassett Law. Um, so whether you look north, south, west, um, uh, you, you've, got, you've got rates higher on, on all sides. The other thing to note is that, yeah, I mean, there is a certain amount of things moving through in waves. And uh, certainly we saw a wave, didn't we, around the city and south. Um, and um, and uh, then latterly, we saw sharply increasing rates in Ashfield, Mansfield and across Bassett Law. I'm sorry, I don't have I don't have the kind of generalised um, insight that you're after, other than to come back to the, the, the science which is that we, we know that this spreads when people come to come together and we know how it spreads and we know how to stop it spreading. So we're not in a hopeless situation in Bassett Law. And if we stick with the kinds of restrictions that we've got, although it is onerous and, and ghastly, it will turn things around and it will bring, th bring it'll curb the trajectory and bring things back into a much favourable position over the next few weeks. Um, and Councillor Doddy, if I have a really quickly um, say, um, yeah, and I note, I mean, for many people working at home, it represents, there's a kind of a burden of isolation as well, in addition to the things that, that, that you said. And I think that some of these things will need taking into account. When in due course, we've finished the COVID response and my team can re-engage with some really important agendas like that of uh, work and health, I think some of the considerations that you've, you've mentioned need wrapping into that as well, because actually, if the pattern of work for people is going to shift very significantly to home working, then yeah, there's a whole load of new things to take into into account. In terms of making a commitment of what that new consultant will uh, be deployed to, I'm going to hold off that and let's get COVID response out the way first. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I've got no more speakers, so we'll now move to the vote. Sarah, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Bosniak. Four. Councillor Doddy. Four. Councillor Elliott. Four. Councillor Fielding. Four. Councillor Harper. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Purdue Horan. Four. Councillor Sissons. 
Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Councillor Weiss. You're on mute, Councillor Weiss. Four. Thank you. Councillor Woodhead. Four. Thank you. That's unanimously agreed. Thank you, Sarah. We'll now move on to item six on the agenda, consultation response and preparation for delivery of the domestic abuse duty. And you'll find that on pages 25 to 34 in your agenda pack. So subject to the Royal Assent of the Domestic Abuse Bill from the 1st of April 2021, it's expected that upper tier local authorities will receive statutory duties for commissioning domestic abuse support services in a safe accommodation. This report provides an update on the proposed statutory duties and preparations for them by the Council. It seeks comment and approval for the County Council's consultation response on the proposed finance model to deliver the duties conferred by the Domestic Abuse Bill set out in Appendix 1. The report also seeks approval for recruitment of a 0.8 full-time equivalent band post for 12 months to prepare for and deliver the statutory duty. The recommendations of the report are set out on page 29 of the agenda pack, which are the committee acknowledges the proposed statutory duties and approves the preparation for their receipt by the council outlined in the report. Two, approves the council's consultation response on the proposed finance model to deliver the duties conferred by the domestic abuse bill set out in appendix one. And finally, three, approves the recruitment of a 0.8 full-time equivalent bandy post for 12 months to prepare and deliver the statutory duty. To debate it, I'll move it. Could I have a seconder, please? That's Councillor Boyd Elliott. Thank you. So, Director of Public Health, Jonathan Gribbin and Rebecca Atchinson, could you please introduce your report? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, the report probably speaks for itself. So, in the interest of time, I'll just hand straight back to you. And I'm happy to take questions with Rebecca's assistance. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor David Martin, please. You muted, David. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting reading and uh, it's a it's a it's a heavy level of duties to place on uh, bloody phone. <laughs> it's a heavy level of duties to place on um, on the county council. The fact that um, 79,000 people across Nottinghamshire are subject to domestic abuse is hugely alarming. Uh, speaking with local police, it's clear that domestic abuse remains a serious issue in places like Ashfield District. And this was especially exacerbated during COVID, uh, where reported incidents of domestic abuse went up significantly. I worry uh, daily about those who suffered in silence. So it's like the tip of the iceberg, really, you know, for the sake of the kids. Um, what are we doing to reach out to victims or what will we be doing to reach out to victims? And I appreciate the majority of these cases are self-referred, um, but we all know that the problem is far worse than these figures suggest. And then I'll, I'll just uh, go on to the next one, um, the domestic abuse bill. I find this a bit odd, really, and I appreciate that the service is currently being funded by accessing victims' housing benefits. But what about this? This misses a whole tranche of people. Who, uh, who own the, their own homes or rent domestic and private properties. Surely uh, this creates an annual overspend. I, I appreciate the domestic abuse bill is currently making progress through Parliament, but I'm concerned that its recommendations will not be met with adequate funding because of this hole in the, in the fabric. And the fact it will place massive duties on, on authorities across England to support survivors and children but this needs to be met with proper funding. Otherwise, it will be the same situ situation that we are currently in with adult health and social care, where we keep delaying the green paper and the white paper. So it's anticipated that these duties will commence in just under five months. So it's a very, very short time span to deal with such a huge tranche of extra work. And I think there are currently 40 units of refuge accommodation across Nottinghamshire. Uh, do we expect to increase this number of refuge places? And I just it's, it's a very short time to uh, to deal with the funding issue, especially when it, it's not clear how they're going to fund it. So perhaps you could answer that. 
you know, how they're going to fund it. Thank you, Councillor okay. Martin. Jonathan, please. Thank you. Um, in a moment or two, if I may, Chair, I'll, I'll ask Rebecca to comment on what we do or what our services do in terms of reaching out to survivors to, to encourage them uh, or enable them in some cases to, to, to disclose and come forward. Um, in terms of the, the, the funding, I mean, that is going to be a, a matter for, for government, um, but you'll note in the consultation response that has been drafted that uh, we wanted in particular to underline that the current funding runs out fairly soon and that it will be important to make sure that either an arrangement is made to continue with that pending this, the rest of this um, build going through um, or that, it, that it's addressed and resolved very quickly because yes we need to make sure that we've got arrangements in place to sustain the current level of accommodation let alone to increase its capacity to um, to address any other any other need that we might identify so the one of the um, uh, in terms of the, the needs in the in the county the other thing I'd come back to is that we recently refreshed our joint strategic needs assessment around this, and that provides probably the best um, sort of rounded statement of the need as it, as it exists at the moment. Chair, if, it, if it's OK with you, I'm, I'll ask Rebecca just to comment on yep. um, the, the work to uh, the outreach work. Rebecca, are you still online? I am. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so you raised some really important points, Councillor Martin, and we recognise that the responsibilities as part of the duty sit alongside the responsibilities that we already have to provide domestic abuse support services across the county. So these will be the the new responsibilities will be aligned with our current responsibilities around support. We have a clear process in place where we promote the services that we have available. And I recognise that that's something that we need to continue with and we, will may, we may need to increase um, over the next few months. Um, the point you made regarding uh, people who are living within their own homes and um, may require additional support, that will be provided by the current services that we have, but the there is an opportunity as part of this new responsibility for us to consider how we um, further improve the system that we have in place uh, for providing support for domestic abuse survivors and make sure that the money that we're contributing into the system is being used as effectively and delivering the best value for money. Um, you. The other thing to bear in mind is that there are current responsibilities with our district council colleagues and these responsibilities relate to sanctuary provision, which is making homes safer so that people can continue to live within their homes and feel safe, which is a massive part of the domestic abuse agenda. Um, and we will continue to work with our district colleague partners uh, to ensure that this element of the system is linked in with the duty and one of the parts of the duty is to make sure that district uh, councils and um, county councils work effectively as one on the domestic abuse agenda. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much yeah, Councillor Martin. Yeah if I may just come back to you yeah yeah thank you very much for that. Um, I mean obviously it's a huge amount of responsibility that the government are legislating to ladle onto the county and I just Need, we need assurances really that it's going to be funded correctly in order to cover the task that it's set up to do. Otherwise, we're going to end up in another black hole like we are with the ever expanding remit of adult health and social care. And that that's a problem. The other the other side to it is as well is the um, the current funding is basically and I did unconscious bias training this week um, or last week, but I'm going to be biased here because the, the, the funding tranche is sexually biased towards women so that I remember the Juno's at Juno Juno and women's aid uh, in in relation to equation get a huge amount of money already from the current funding and equation gets a very small uh, portion of that and and of course males are the least likely to admit to being suffer, you know suffer suffering domestic abuse so so there's two sides to it, really. One is there's a bit of a sexual imbalance on the spend, and I suppose you lot know because you you deal with the statistics and the analytics of it. But also, we need to make sure that 
we're going to get the right legislation in place about funding. Otherwise, it's it's going to be very difficult to deal with the problems. Can I could I come in, chair? The 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 funding will be a matter for for government. And yes, of course, we want it to be properly funded. In terms of its allocation, it's allocated to survivors and victims. Um, it's not allocated on the basis of gender or or sexuality. But the reality is is that the vast majority of survivors are women. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Muriel Wise, please. Um, yes, thank you. I mean, really, just to say that um, we were involved in the original consultation, weren't we, way back about where the responsibilities should be set. And uh, it, it makes complete sense that the responsibilities are with the top tier authorities. And I'm encouraged to hear that that the networking with district councils in Nottinghamshire is in place for um, you know, the local cooperation to be in place. I mean, like uh, Councillor Martin, I'm concerned about the funding. I just wondered if there's anything we can do as, uh, as councillors and as a committee to support you in getting the appropriate funding. Because I think the, the, the process and the structure is, is the right way for Mary, you've uh, muted yourself. Well, when I said all that. Yeah, OK, thank you. Over to you, Jonathan. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I've said all I needed to say. Yeah. Um, so, well, so thank you, Councillor, for, yeah, for raising it. I, I think I'd also note that for the time being, we don't know what the public health grant will be for next year either. So. Um, there are, a, I guess, a, a growing list of things that government will need to mm -hmm. to attend to. Not just that, that's not to discount your the the point that you're making, but um, that alongside with how we will fund um, all of the other things in public health, um, we, we're also keen to to understand as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, that was the last speaker, so I'll now move to the vote. Zara, please. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bosniak. You're on mute, Councillor Bosniak. Three. Oh, four. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Doddy. Four. Councillor Elliott. Four. Councillor Fielding. Four. Councillor Harper. Four. Councillor Martin. Yeah, four. Councillor Purdue Horan. Four. Councillor Sissons. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Councillor Weiss. Four. Councillor Woodhead. Four. Thank you, Chairman. That's agreed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to item seven on the agenda. The development of a departmental approach to co-production, working together to make things better, and you'll find it on pages 35 to 44 in your agenda pack. The report details actions taken to move towards a departmental approach to co-production since the last report to committee and in light of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the response to this. The report presents an update on the work of the co-production steering group and the current direction of travel for co-production within the department and the next steps that are planned for this work. The recommendations of the report are set out on pages 38 of your agenda pack, which are one, that committee considers whether any further actions it requires to progress towards a departmental approach to co-production. Two, that committee considers how it can build co-production further into decision making. Three, that committee members consider how they can promote co-production. And four, that a further report on progress be brought to the committee in six months. To debate it, I'll formally move the recommendations. Do I have a seconder, please? Second, second there. Councillor Boyd Elliott. Uh, so over to Corporate Director Melanie Brooks, please, who will also introduce a good friend to this committee, Edlo. Melanie, please. Yes, yeah, so Eddie, could you go on camera, please, and just introduce yourselves yep. to yourself to committee? Hello, I'm Ed Lowe. I'm co-chair of the co new co-production steering group. I co-chaired the Disability Independent Advisory Group for a number of years before it was disbanded, and this is my new role amongst many other things. <laughs> 
Thank you, Ed. So I'm not intending to talk very much, but Ed is going to, has kindly offered to give committee an update as to the works. So I just wanted to frame it a little. So as you all know, we had quite ambitious plans for co-production this year and COVID has, has affected us, I suppose, in two ways. The first is our ability to get people together to talk is particularly strained and access to teams is a difficulty um, for people. And secondly, because that that the response takes our you know, our energy and our effort, but it has been really important that we start to take some small steps. And Ed is going to talk about that approach, how it's working, and particularly how the task and finish groups and the things that we're focusing on are those areas that people have identified themselves as being important things that they want the department to change. Because so the number of things that people have told me for some time, we just don't do very well. So that's where our focus is but like I say you hear from me enough so the intention was that Ed can give you a bit of a flavour as to how the steering group has worked the things that it's achieved so far and what it wants to do next so is that okay Ed to pass yep. over yep thank you very much indeed Melanie um well for those of you who were involved in the uh service user groups that we had before so i.e the Disability Independent Advisory Group, um, OPAG, and Learning Disability Partnership Board. What we've what we've done with co-production co going forward, or what we're trying to do, is establishing small groups, which are called task and finish groups. So we look at areas of work that people have told us that they want to work on. So for example, at the moment, we've got a task and finish group in relation to um, disability related expenses in terms of what the council will take into account when asking people for contributions towards their care. We've also got, um, what are the other ones we've got? We've got um, uh, a, a task and finish group in relation to direct payment and we're looking at the information that we send out to people that's another one so and we've got a few other ones but we're we're always looking for new ideas to be able to take things forward and what what the steering group do is we discuss everything that we want to m talk about and also we oversee the task and finish groups that, that are currently in operation. And the main difference that the task and finish groups have compared to what we had before is that we have a small group of experts by experience who are currently on the groups. So we meet up um, to talk about all the issues that I've just mentioned, and then we do the work which we've intended to do, and then the task and finish group is disbanded. So it's not a it's not a group which will meet for months and months and months. It's where it's a much more targeted approach, whereby we do the work and then we move on to something different. And another thing that we're wanting to do is to encourage other people that use services. Um, to actually become involved in the group. So we're looking at that as well. Um, have I missed anything, Mel? Can you just... No, I, I don't think so, Ed. The full list of the, the groups are on page 37, so paragraph 15. Um, and as Ed said, each, each of the groups is led by um, a peer chair alongside a lead officer. So it's a, it's a partnership and it pulls together people that want to make a difference in the area and it will work for as long as is needed. So some of the task and finish groups could be done in one or two sessions. Um, some of them may have a longer life. So that, that's the intention and it's action orientated and improvement orientated um, in a way that the, the, the groups before didn't yeah. have a focus. Um, the, co the steering group um, defined co-production in its own terms and so that was a small task and finish group just with use, um, people with lived experience and their carers doing that definition it wasn't officers and I think we all agreed that the next step is to re review progress and to think about what we do in the longer term yeah. clearly we're still under COVID operating which really constrains mm. um, our work but I mm. think there's also other work in the department about getting devices and connectivity out to people yeah. 
um, that we're hoping will help people participate. But that is a, yeah. a constraint on what we're doing at the moment. And it, so thank you very much, Ed, for that. Is there anything I else, Ed? I want to add something else to that. We are, I'm very keen to actually find ways that people that haven't been involved before to be involved. So whether it be a member, whether it to be a member of the group, whether it be to give us their thoughts and feedback on the survey, whether some, whether we make phone contact with them or whatever we do. So I'm really, really pleased to be involved in this work. We've made, we've made good progress going forward. Um, there is a number of reports that the task and finish groups have worked on, which have been going to senior leadership team and other and other places where appropriate. So you will see us gradually with more and more and more. And it's a pleasure to be involved and to work with such a great team of individuals as well. Thank you, Ed. You're welcome. Thank you. Is that it, uh, Melanie? Yeah, happy Thank to you. answer some questions or Ed. Thank yep. you. So I've got Councillor Muriel Wise, please. Yeah, thank you both very much for that. Uh, I'm just wondering how are people invited into uh, the task and finish groups at the moment? I take Ed's point that uh, uh, he wants to um, draw more people in. Uh, I know we've sometimes had groups um, uh, as, as an earlier part of this progress, uh, a process, uh, so people who were kind of described as seldom heard. And it, it's trying to reach those people, isn't it? That's the challenge. I'd also wonder if it would be useful for us to have the names of the people who are in the steering group in case we um, we think of people that might be interested yeah. in any of the topics. Yes. We could put in contact. Um, do you want to say yeah. that, Melanie, or shall I? Well, I do want to say a little bit about how people have been identified in the task and finish groups you've been involved in, because they're all they're all different, aren't they, depending on okay. the work? Yes. Um, yes. But did you want to just give yeah. some examples of the ones that you've been involved in? Yeah. For example, at the moment, I'm involved in the disability related expenses um, group, which is where we have, as I say, we've compiled a report to be able for senior leadership and we because we're wanting to look and just really look at and for when for when we're we're charging people for the for their care what uh, we the council are going to consider and take into account before asking people to pay and and so for example we've got um We've got somebody from Reach on that um, task and finish group, somebody whose son uses services, and we've also got myself, and we've also got other people who are on that committee as well, all with people that use services. So it's everybody who's got a specific interest in that area, me being one of them. The next one that I'm involved in is because I'm a recipient of them, is direct payments. And the information that is given, that is sent out to people. So we're going to be looking at that, seeing what ways we can make things better, easier information for people to understand. Um, so that's for that one. And one of the other things we're looking at is uh, about complaints and about resolvement. Yep, so, so each of the new task and finish groups, um, Councillor Vice, the first task will be for the, the two chairs to, if you like, set up the objectives of it, and that will be how they decide to invite the number of people from that topic area. Yeah. So I suppose my vision would be if it's about direct payments, we would look at people we know in the service who are very interested because we know who some of that, so those people are. People have been particularly vocal, so there are some people we have relationships with because of complaints and other things, so we engage that yeah. group um, yeah. and then others in the service area. So it'd be a whole range of means of identifying. Yeah. I think in different times, we probably would have had open events, but I, I think it's still possible for us to think about doing some webinars. But the first task will be for those two people to think about that, how to get yeah. the right people in the room. 
Yeah. yeah. Thank and you. in terms of reference as well, we have to include that at the first at the first point. Yeah. And and then we look and see who we can possibly ask to be involved in that group. So there's ways and means. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Muriel? Yes, it does. I'm just one other thought. Um, I, I think it'd be really good if, when the new um, when the new councillor is uh, appointed next um, spring, if co-production could be one of the induction uh, could be part of the induction program, because I think mm. we still need to do a lot of work on improving people's understanding about the difference between consultation and co-production. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very um, much, Muriel. Uh, the next speaker I've got is Councillor Joyce Bosniak, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for that presentation, Ed. Um, I've just got a, a couple of questions. You've got, you know, the, it looks as though the, the group has got a, a great deal of work. You've got seven bullet points at, at paragraph 15 for different yeah. areas for potential task and finish work. Uh, yeah. That, I think it could be even longer than that, couldn't it, as we progress, when yeah. people really yeah. start to understand it. So my question was really about, well, obviously it can't be static, because this is co-production, so we know that it's going to change this in response to what people say they want and need. So I just want to know whether it is going, it is going to be an ongoing thing, uh, rather than just a task and finish. There'll always be a need, won't there, to to act upon what people say they want yes. it has yes. to be alive doesn't it it's not just a boring yeah. committee is it yeah that's right great yeah that's fine um, from my from my point of view it's i would describe it and i'm just trying to think of an example when a when somebody who uses services has a um assessment of whatever sort the, the worker will um, be allocated to them and then they, the worker will do that work with that individual and then and then the, the case will be closed. I'm envisaging that the task and finish groups will work, will work on that similar, similar vein in terms of the work will be done everything will be finished off but if there is something else that comes up in that area it can always be re redone as a new task and finish group do you see what i mean so it's yeah, I just have i explained that well enough melanie <laughs> do you want to come in there yeah i, I think so so the so the agenda will be dynamic won't it but yeah. what we're trying to set up is a is a framework for the department that has it's got life and continuity and becomes a way of working yeah um and had we not had the pandemic i would have hoped that by this point we would have had a fully worked up paper that would have come to committee that said this is a framework this is how we're doing it this is how we're resourcing it this is the priorities but clearly that that you know hasn't we haven't had an ideal world have we but no. that is that is the plan um joyce that yeah. next year at some point we'll be bringing that work back but at the moment it's trying to just have something to keep you know, keep the momentum we going. We're taking over. Fine, thank you. Thank you. And the final speaker is Councillor Andy Sissons, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I was I was just wondering if uh, we had somebody in on our patch who uses services who we thought might be um, useful to join one of the task and finish groups. Is there scope for that? You know, how how could somebody get involved that um, could could be useful to the work on co-production? What a, can can I answer that, Melanie, or do you want to answer that? No, you go ahead, Ed. Um, well, yes, because we want if if you come across people in with your can in your constituency that you think may want to become involved then then what we want what i'm wanting to do is set something up like a um because i've got a facilitator who works with me sarah craggs and i'm due to have a 
conversation with her this afternoon as a catch up. So what I can do is when I've had that catch up, I will raise that with her. And then what we can do is we can give you the means so that people can contact us to become involved. But yeah. I'll just finalise it with Sarah before before I say anything. But I'll get back to M Melanie or I'll get back to whoever with an answer later on this afternoon. Yeah, thank That's you. It. Yeah, if somebody has something to contribute or an issue they're particularly concerned about they'd like to see changes, to feed that through um, council systems through to me and then we can pass that on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I um, th th thank you for that answer. Um, a, a young lady I've spoken about to you before, Mel, I, I think could be useful. Um, and, and it would give her a sense of um, hmm. great achievement to, to be involved in the process. So if somebody could email me um, a contact or, or, or if it was all right to email yourself, Mel, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a young lady who would uh, love yeah. to be involved. Obviously, if I asked her first, of course. Yes, I I would be happy to do, to do that, Mel. So if um, I'm more than happy to get in touch with council assistants about that, if, if you're willing, let me do that. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll, um, I'll I'll send you an email with my details on. Then we can then when you speak to the lady to see whether she is interested, then give me her details and then I'll take it from there. Thank you very much, Ed. Yeah. Thank do, you. Do, yeah, just in terms of data protection and and managing confidential information, if it can come through myself okay. and I can make the linkages, that's like, sorry, I'd I didn't appreciate that. I'd forgotten about that. Bit. Sorry, Mel. That's okay. Thank you both. Thank you. Councillor Martin, please, if you'd like to ask your question, if you could keep it concise, please, because we are running out of yeah, time. Yes, I will. I'll try, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got two residents of very, very different, uh, with very, very different physical disabilities who, who struggle to reach out to people because they live in isolation, mm -hmm. especially during COVID, that's been exacerbated. They've only actually seen the carers. So I was just wondering if there was something we could probably put on not to help yourself, but where people could access a group and, and I think it'd be dead good to have like a Teams meeting for head to chair and run with people who are in isolation across the county because I know for a fact that one of, one of my residents is frustrated as hell because he can't go out because he's vulnerable uh, in, the, in that vulnerable age group as well because he's just over 60. And the young girl, she, she lost a limb through meningitis. So, you know, she, they, they both equally would be um, interested in this kind of uh, meeting up of minds yeah. and, and facilitating it. Okay, well, if you speak to Mel, then I'm sure we can look at something. Yeah, it's just just to be clear, this isn't about support. So this isn't about meeting people's needs to isolate and get together. This is about focused work on service improvement. Yeah. Um, but Not to Help Yourself does have information about other support groups. So that that is already there because there are a number of the commission services, as you heard from Natalie earlier, across adults and health that have got gone virtual support groups but yeah this is very much about co-production this is about influencing um policy so the the intention is about having that influence on the service not necessarily about getting support because we're feeling lonely or isolated which is a valid need in itself mm -hmm. so hopefully that there's a difference yes yeah, so, sorry i'm miss, miss, missing the point there but what i'm saying is both of those people receive care in different ways for different yeah. aspects of what you're talking about yeah. so you probably would both be wanting to input on that Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to the vote. Sarah, please. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bosniak. Four. Councillor Doddy. Four. Councillor Elliott. Four. Councillor Fielding. Four. Councillor Harper. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Purdue Horan. Four. Councillor Sissons. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Councillor Weiss. Four. Councillor Woodhead. Four. Thank you. That's agreed unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, hopefully, Ed, we'll all see you soon, shortly. Thank, thank, thank you very, very much, much for coming to the committee meeting. Thank You're you. You're very welcome.
We'll now move care. on to item eight on the agenda, developing short break service and support for carers in Nottinghamshire, which is on pages 45 to 54 on your agenda. The report proposes the vision for the way in which adult social care and health will support and enable carers to access breaks from their caring role, which will also benefit the person they're caring for. The report also presents the proposed development of short breaks provision in the short to medium term in response to the COVID-19 crisis and also for the long term future. Details of this are covered in paragraphs 18 to 24. The work being undertaken will form part of the wider review of carer services and will be the basis of an updated carer strategy, a draft of which is intended to be brought to committee in March 2021 next year. The recommendations of the report are set out on page 53 of your agenda pack, which are the committee approves the plan to further develop alternative COVID secure short break options in the interim to support people during the continued period of social distancing guidelines. Two, approves the vision of the development of short breaks and the co-production approach the department proposes to take to develop an interim and short term short break support options for carers and inform a wider revised carer strategy for carers. Three, considers whether there are any further actions it, it requires arising from the information in the report on the development of the short break support for carers and the broader carer strategy. And finally, agrees to receive a report on the draft updated carer strategy in March 2021 and that this be included in the work programme. So to debate it, I'll formally move the recommendations. Do I have a seconder, please? Second that. Thank you. That's Councillor Boyd Elliott. Service Director Ainsley MacDonald, please, could you introduce the report? Ainsley MacDonald? Yes, uh, apologies, Chair. I'm having a, a bit of a technical difficulty in that I can't open the papers at all, um, which, which isn't particularly helpful. Uh, I just can't open the reports whatsoever. Uh, I've just messaged Sarah to see if she can assist and send send it to me by uh, by email um, because uh, none of my uh, documents are opening whatsoever. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you're able to 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 help at all, but I can't access any of the documents. Yeah, Sarah's hey, beaver in a way. Should I start while Sarah's doing that? Should I? Yeah. No, I, I really, I really don't mind. Um, <laughs> I think the place I wanted to start really is about the impact of COVID nineteen on carers. So paragraph fourteen. So, so clearly, I mean, in terms of any admission to some sort of residential unit, um, COVID really impacts the running of that unit, both in terms of isolation. So. Um, anybody going into a new, as a new admission has a period of self-isolation, but also about the capacity because of operating COVID secure. So we know that um, some of the more traditional means we've had of supporting people is quite um, difficult in terms of capacity and access at the moment. We also know that carers are under increased strain. So I think one of the interesting things about the pandemic is that some people um, find their positions improved. Some people are, because family are at home, some people may have been furloughed, people aren't going out more. That has improved some relationships and we've got some good stories that demonstrates that. On the other hand, it can exacerbate strain on relationships. So as we know, carers anyway have a lot to cope with, um, financial strain, difficulties on personal life, personal freedom. So I think the, the pandemic has had some consequences about that. We have worked really hard to redeploy um, staff into providing support at home, as you know, through day services. So we try to support some of that lack of access to services with that one to one support. But we do think there's further work we need to do to just make sure that what we're providing is suitable and adequate and accessible. And I'm sure that when Ainsley gets the report, she, if she's got anything to add on that, um, I'm sure she will add on. Paragraphs 25 are just talking about um, how we operate. So there's more detail there in how the existing residential services are accessed. And that also applies to services we commission outside. The same rules around social distancing, the, um, the capacity, 
and the for the isolation um, applies wherever somebody is going. It's not just for our own services. I think really, I think what we want to get across here is that our vision is that we would want to have more support for carers than we currently do. So I think if you were to look at who accesses our services, the patterns of usage, we'd find that there would be a bias towards certain groups. So really our ambition is that we increase care of support overall and we increase the flexibility of that. So the planning is useful for some, but it's a barrier for others. And when we talk to carers, whether that's locally or nationally, we know that what carers want is a variety of options for short breaks, having day respite, holidays, um, the ability to go away and receive support with the person, as well as the ability for the cared for and the carer to have separate breaks. So I think what where we'd like to get to is a much broader, more substantial offer, and we want to get there through co-production. So hopefully, um, I think Ainsley might have the papers, and there may be things that I've missed off that she'll want to highlight. Yes, no, after um, after a few different attempts, Sarah's managed to get, get it to me. Uh, so I think I think the only thing uh, that that I would add really is about having that broader view of, of what constitutes uh, a short break. Um, I, I think we have a propensity to to think of a short break as being an overnight stay, which uh, it it doesn't need to be. Uh, you know, quite often someone might just need uh, a, f a few hours uh, of an evening um, or daytime to enable them to go shopping or to go out. Uh, so you know, we just we just want people to think uh, more broadly about what a break is and what the right kind of break is for them. Uh, I think often, uh, you know, people will will take up uh, the offer that we have, uh, particularly around our residential uh, short breaks provision. Uh, but we need to be a little bit more creative uh, and, and think through actually, you know, what is the best solution uh, for, for the carer and also uh, the care for person uh, I mean personally I'd, I'd like to see much more use of uh, you know supported holidays for example uh, where the care for person actually you know goes and, and has an enjoyable holiday themselves and more use of you know engaging people with potentially uh, clubs or activities uh, within the local communities uh, with support uh, so you know that that's uh, certainly my hope but as melanie said you know we will be doing this through uh, co-production um, and it will be you know very much uh, led by uh, you know the people that use the services uh, you know cared for and the and the carer uh, and also people who may use our services in the future because i'm sure our our young people uh, who may be coming into adult services over the next few years probably have a whole range of, of different ideas about you know how they would like uh, to have breaks uh, provided to them so i'm happy to take uh, any questions that you might have uh, in relation to the report and apologies for the technical issues it always happens uh, at, right at the, the last minute Thank you, Ainsley. And it's not a problem. We always get around these things and it happens to all of us. I've got Councillor David Martin followed by Councillor Muriel Wise. So David Martin, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I'm wholeheartedly in support of this. Uh, short breaks or respite care, as it used to be known, is obviously absolutely vital. Uh, approximately six and a half million carers in the UK are unpaid, with three million of them balancing work and caring responsibilities. One of the problems, of course, again, and I'll go back to it again, is the government's failure to write the green paper and so subsequently the white paper on adult health and social care. Um, because as time goes on, uh, the, the figure of six and a half billion unofficial carers will increase. And I get frustrated at the word unofficial. However, as far as a per the person being cared for is, is as far as they're concerned, these carers are a lifeline. They're the only people they see. You know? So that they, according to Carers UK, more than three quarters or 78% of carers say the needs of the person they're, they're caring for has increased during the coronavirus pandemic. So they complained about being exhausted with many of them 
having to fit work or other family commitments in too. So in a survey of uh, 5,904 carers in September, found about 80% are providing more care than they were doing before lockdown. Oh. So two thirds said they were worried about how they will cope with further lockdowns and local restrictions. The extra burden has left three quarters of them feeling worn out and 64% with worsening mental health and 58% being their physical health affected. I therefore fully back the short breaks plans to give our army of unpaid carers a rest. And actually, the other the other issue is here, of course, with unpaid carers is the uh, contactability with the, with them because not all of them reach out to the county council or any other funding source whatsoever and they do it for years because they're often family members unpaid and they dedicate their lives they even pack work up to look after their elderly parents or disabled sisters or brothers or whoever it may be these are the people that we need to get in contact with because these are the people that end up isolated and bereft when these people pass away and they're left on their own and that's what they've been doing for the last five years and they sort of end up on like a, a shelf where, where nobody knows about them and, and they've been doing it unpaid for years and, and they don't even contemplate asking for money for looking after these people. So these are some of the people that we really do need and they are out there working every day even now we need to reach out to those people and get to them and sort of say this is a bit of help you could have even though you don't get paid. Mm. That's my point and, that, and that we really do need to do that. Okay Hi. thank you Chair. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I've got Sue Batty. Is, is it on this particular subject, Sue? Yes, it is. Just really briefly to show councillors that there's a lot of work going on, actually reaching out to carers uh, through a, a, a range of different social media. Um, and the carers have, are increasing their well-being calls um, during lockdown and there's extra resources. Volunteer services are offering socially distant walk for all carers, um, including young carers. There's a lot of promotion of mental health services within that. There's uh, some specific support group for different <laughs> ethnic communities being set up and sessions planned around finance, benefits, uh, grief sessions, dementia awareness, some of the legal aspects. So I know we're short of time, I won't go on, but there is a, a raft of different things that we're doing through the Carers Hub to reach out and contact carers more broadly. Thank you, Sue. Ainsley, have you got anything else to add? Um, only just just uh, to add to, to Sue's point, I mean, certainly uh, during the first wave uh, of, of COVID, we did see an awful lot of our usual carers not take up uh, you know, the, the, the breaks uh, that they would normally would. Uh, certainly this time round, we're seeing a lot more care of stress and we're ensuring that, you know, we are uh, offering breaks to to all those carers that, that you know, may not be uh, admitting uh, to stress, but, you know, through our regular contact with them, we can see that they're stressed uh, and our short breaks capacity is fully booked uh, up to Christmas now. Uh, with with Kayla breaks. Thank you, Ainsley. Councillor Muriel Wise, please. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair. Now I think it's really good that it's an ambitious paper, because the uh, the the range of what's offered during short breaks does uh, uh, will will really benefit from uh, refreshing and opening up. Um, I I know for many carers they. The opportunity to have a have respite and have it on a regular basis, two or three times a year is is really important. I think it's also about the the uh, what's available for the person who's coming uh, for respite. And I think I've seen the extremes of it. Um, you know, for example, one one ad young adult uh, going on a regular basis to the same respite care centre. And during the week, just uh, booking in to the day centre that was near the respite care centre. I mean, as much by his parents' wishes or anything else, but actually it wasn't um, it wasn't anything refreshing for him. It was just uh, he was being looked after while his um, <clears throat> his parents had a break. We've also seen someone. Uh, who was very dependent on his parents going to respite care 
and that opening the door for him moving into independence. And in fact, during the the time at the particular respite care centre, he began to agree to him moving into supported living with someone he'd met during the respite care. And then at the other extreme, uh, when the Skylarks was open, and um, I know it's not a model that people are opting for now, but a, a good friend of mine used to book in there for what they call the Music Week. And they brought in about four people from Opera North and created um, uh, opera with the, the people who were there for the week. And, uh, so, I mean, it's the range. It, it can be really enhancing, can't it? And yeah, I think that's the way we want to go. Both support the carer, but giving something stimulating to the person who's uh, coming away from home. Thank you. Ainsley, please. Uh, I, I would just absolutely agree with uh, Muriel's points. Uh, you know, that that's one of the things that I really hope we get out of this is to widen out that range. And I really like the idea of, you know, a, a, a themed uh, week. And I'm sure that's probably something that we could steal. So so thank you, Councillor Boyce. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Councillor David Martin, you've already asked one question. Is it a very quick one? Because we are running short of time. Yeah, yeah, it's a quick one, Chair. Yeah, yeah, it's a quick one. Um, can you can you give us a brief over, overview of the capacity for respite care during COVID? Because obviously it's going to be difficult to provide it. Um, it, it has been difficult. Uh, we did provide uh, short breaks, although on a limited basis, uh, throughout the last uh, lockdown period uh, and also through the summer and we're continuing through this lockdown period now one of the things that we did use our short breaks units for uh, last time round was uh, to accept covid positive discharges from hospital which did limit uh, our short breaks capacity however as i said earlier uh, there was an awful lot of people who didn't want to come into our short breaks buildings because of the anxieties uh, around, uh, you know, their, their vulnerable uh, cared for person mixing. Um, however, this time round, we have said that we will only allocate one of the short breaks units uh, for COVID discharge should that be needed. Uh, and we've prioritised the other two uh, units for short breaks for carers. Uh, so we still have, you know, quite sufficient capacity, uh, although, you know, social distancing uh, does have an impact, uh, but we can still take uh, somewhere between uh, 20 to 30 people uh, over the course of the week between the two units. Thank you, Ainsley. Uh, there are no more speakers, so could we now move to the vote, please, Sarah? Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bosniak. <coughs> Four. Thank you. Councillor Doddy. Four. Councillor Elliott. Four. Councillor Fielding. Four. Councillor Harper. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Purdue Horan. Four. Councillor Sissons. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Councillor Weiss. Four. Councillor Woodhead. Four. That's agreed unanimously, Chair. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item nine on the agenda, which is review of commissioning function with Integrated Strategic Commission and Service Improvement Directorate. So this report provides committee with a proposal to realign functions and activities across the Integrated Strategic Commissioning and Service Improvement Directorate that builds on the new workforce operating model. The summary and key findings for service improvement identify a more defined offer that focuses on three distinct areas of responsibility, service improvement, digital business systems and data quality and quality and practice. As the structure moves towards three distinct areas of responsibility, a reduction in strategic development managers at band E is proposed, subject to the outcome of the consultation process. The review has captured the need for quality market management to assume responsibility for the management of all contracts, including non-statutory providers currently managed by the strategic commissioning.
One of the main outcomes of the review is the proposal for the discontinuation of the partnership team with in integrated and joint commissioning functions, moving to integrated strategic commissioning as part of the wider commissioning agenda. Whilst ICT interoperability and digital development aligns with business systems that sit within service improvement, this would put three band E transformation manager posts at risk subject to the outcome of the consultation process. The recommendations of the report as set out on pages 61 and 62 of the agenda pack are that the committee gives approval to realign functions and activities and to rename teams to provide greater clarity of roles and responsibilities as detailed in paragraphs 13, 19, 20, 21 and 32 and two, to make the necessary staff changes to support the change in activities as described. This includes the de-establishment of the temporary 0.8 full-time equivalent Better Care Fund Programme Manager, which is Band F, the discontinuation of the partnership team subject to consultation in line with HR processes, which would result in the de-establishment of three full-time equivalent transformation manager Band E posts. The reduction of 1.5 full-time equivalent strategic development manager Band E posts within the service improvement subject to consultation in line with the HR processes. The de-establishment of vacant temporary and permanent posts. The establishment of one full-time equivalent strategic development officer grade five post, one commissioning officer post and one full-time equivalent contract performance officer band A post. I formally move the recommendations. Do I have a seconder, please? Second. Yeah, Councillor Purdue Horan, thank you very much. Uh, Corporate Director Melanie Brooks, please, could you introduce the report? Um, thank you. So I, I don't think I've got too much more to, to add, um, Councillor Harper, uh, following that introduction. But I think just to, to frame it in, in the context. So this, we obviously we um, took to committee this time last year. It's hard to believe it's been 12 months. Yeah. Um, but the new operating model for the department, which was approved, implementation of that was delayed. So we're due to go live on the 1st of April. We had to delay that till the 1st of September because of um, COVID. We undertook at committee this time last year to review um, structure following implementation to make further changes. So this report is, is having a look um, at the changes we can make following the implementation. Implementation timeline is a risk at the moment because of our COVID response. So we're currently redeploying teams and individuals from right across the strategic commissioning function into quality market management to manage care home outbreaks and that will be the, the steady state for some time so it's just to note that implementation uh, may move slightly off off the timeline so that that's a key risk just to flag to committee but i think the proposal still stand fast in terms of comparing the progress in where we were before um, and there will be formal consultation we've only had very early engagement given the papers coming to committee with staff and trade unions and that's going to be a priority um, going forward that's all I have to really add chair thank you Melanie I've got Councillor Joyce Bosniak followed by Councillor Muriel Wise Councillor Joyce Bosniak please um, thank you chair there was a bit of panic then when I raced from one side of the room to the other to plug in I was just about the battery was about to go flat so I do apologize I've just got uh, just a couple of questions uh, and then I missed the last point that Melanie made so I'll just ask that question as well. Um, well the transformation managers I know were brought in for a specific reason and that was about uh, the integration with health and making sure that the relationship with health was uh, developed and is a strong one and, and I know that they've been really really successful so I just wanted to hear from Melanie exactly why we've decided to, what is the rationale for getting rid of those particular positions? And then my second question, which I think you've just answered, but I didn't quite get, was around uh, negotiation and consultation with trade unions. And, and going back to what we've just been talking about, about co-production, what kind of input have staff had in coming to determining those um, uh, changes as well? So just a series of questions really for you. Thank you, Joyce. Melanie, please. 
Yep. So the main rationale, uh, as it is in the report, so when we reviewed against the original objectives of the operator model, we found that we had some significant duplication in some areas. So if you if you recall, I, I know it was some time ago, yeah. but what I think you've you lost your signal. You have Melanie. I don't know when I muted myself then, actually. That must, <laughs> must be the bang in the papers on the keyboard. Um, so I don't know which bits I said, but one of the principles of the workforce model was about making sure that managers took responsibility for a number of things. So one is about the integration with health. So it's very much the team manager's role and the group managers through the primary care networks to build those relationships and to build those things. So that, I think that was one, one principle, as well as safeguarding and a whole lot of other tasks. But this is about integration, so I'll stick with that. Um, and the other bit was that we had, would always flag that certain functions were dependent on the relationship with health and funding from health. So some of that funding, um, the CCGs haven't been minded to continue. So we're, we're looking to mainstream some of that. So it's not that the work's going to go away. That important work about driving that will be there. It's just that that will be happening either in team managers, operational managers, or in mainstream commissioning roles, rather than having somebody else who's responsible for integration in addition to commissioning. Because when we commission, for example, we should be commissioning in integrated ways rather than there being a commissioning manager for mental health and then somebody in the service responsible for integration with health. It doesn't kind of make sense. So it's about trying to get rid of that duplication, and having clarity of purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce, any supplementary? It, it, yes, it was just a point about the consultation with the trade unions as well. What has actually taken place? So the, we're, we're not in formal consultation yet. So that's that's the next step of the process. Thank you. Councillor Muriel Wise, please. Yes, uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with the overall um, aspiration that you have for the department. I'm just not really clear about the benefits and drawbacks of the of this particular uh, package of decisions, um, whether it become less less effective in, in a sort of outward looking team, um, you know, whether the, it'll be strong enough to, to do the, the work that you wanted to do. I'm minded to abstain on this really uh, until there's more consultation and we're clear about what about what the issue about the posts at risks are. Um, if it's not, um, if the, yeah, if, if the whole uh, package, as it were, isn't going to be finalised until March. I just think perhaps it's best to kind of, you know, come back with it when the con some more consultation has been done with both staff and the unions, and uh, there's a, it's got a more confident base to it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Melanie. I obviously can't comment on the preference in supporting the paper or not, but. The, um, the overarching changes are in paragraph 19 and, and 20. So like I said, it's mainly about clarity of purpose. So having contract management in one place. And I think just to note, this is about the adult social care piece of work. I think there's other work to do about a departmental approach and a broader council approach about some of these functions. Um, and, and there is work in training across the council to do that. But this is very much um, about making sure we're clear about where the contract management work happens, where the strategy development work happens, and that's part of that strategy development. Building the relationships across the system is part of what a commissioner does. We don't have separate people whose role it is to build relationships. So, but, but like I say, I think that hopefully those are articulated in those paragraphs. But I, I can't comment on the on whether the paper's approved or not. No, sure, no, sure, sure. Thank you. Councillor David Martin, please. Yeah, so tell us a bit of uh, clarity, please, Mel. Are you saying then, because obviously you've just said in the previous statement that the workload is still there and the work will still need to be done, but you have the capacity to do it with the other members of staff in the various departments that you've got, so you're making a reduction because you feel that these are now superfluous appointments? Yes. With that, with that specific question, yes. That is the basis of the paper. Thank you very much. I've got no more speakers, so could we take it to the vote, please, Sarah? Okay. Thank Stop you, Chairman. Advice. Okay, Councillor Bosniak. Abstain. Councillor Doddy. Uh, for 
Councillor Elliott. Four. Councillor Fielding. Abstain. Councillor Harper. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Purdue Horan. Four. Councillor Sissons. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Councillor Weiss. Abstain. Councillor Woodhead. Abstain. So that's seven voting for and four abstentions. So that's carried. Thank you, Sarah. We'll now move on to item 10 on the agenda, change of staffing establishment in the preparing for adult team. Uh, I've been advised that further work is required on this report and therefore I've agreed to defer the item to the next meeting. Item 11 is the work programme, which is on pages 73 to 77 in your pack. The recommendation of the report as set out on page 74 of the agenda pack is that the committee considers whether any amendments are required to the work programme. Uh, I formally move the recommendations. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor Martin, are you seconding? I will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, are there any changes to the work programme arising from discussions today, please? Um, there was the item that Councillor Martin, I think he probably wants to, to raise anyway, um, to do with um, uh, homelessness and the lessons learned, etc. But I'm sure he can um, elaborate on what he wanted to, to cover. Thank you, Sarah. Councillor Martin, please. Yeah, I just wanted to go further into uh, whether we've learned any lessons during COVID about dealing with the homelessness situation, because it's it's been quite an, an issue and it has an impact on male suicide as well. So that's, that's one of the work programmes I'd like to see more more, more about. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Martin, as you raised it earlier and everybody was in agreement. So thank you for raising that. Uh, Councillor Muriel Wise, please. Thanks, Chair. Just wondering where a report's coming back about the short breaks. And perhaps I haven't seen it, but I just wonder what um, Ainsley and Melanie thought was a good, a, a timely opportunity to bring that back to us. Thank you. Corporate Director Melanie Brooks, please. In the report, we had said in six months, I believe. All oh, right. OK, thank but you. It's a helpful reminder to add that to the work programme. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, anybody else got anything they want to add to the work programme? I, I know you probably get sick of me saying it, but this is your opportunity mm -hmm. to put items onto the work programme should you want it to be discussed. Uh, Tony, I think I mentioned the working from home risks. Yeah, uh, you did, John. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. A clear strategy for the protection of those people who uh, may not understand the risks that they find themselves in through no fault of their own and a changing shift of the working environment. And I think there's quite a bit of work to be done around that. And I think it'd be nice at some stage as we move forward to, to address it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Doddy. Apologies. Yes, you did mention it. I do remember you mentioning it. And that will go on the work programme, provided everybody votes for it. Uh, so we'll now move to the vote, please, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. So, so that's agreeing of the work programme with the two additional items plus the items that we agreed throughout the uh, the meeting that, uh, set out in the reports. Councillor Bosniak. Four. Councillor Doddy. Four. Councillor Elliott. Four. Councillor Fielding. Four. Councillor Harper. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Purdue Horan. Four. Councillor Sissons. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Councillor Weiss. Four. Councillor Woodhead. Four. That's unanimously agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Well, that concludes the business of the committee today. Can I thank everyone for attending? There's been some really good questions, a lot of good impact input from members, and I thank you for that. The, the downside of that, of course, is that the meetings run on, but I think it's important to ask the questions that you've asked. So I may, may I take this opportunity to thank any viewers for their interest in the meeting, and we wish you all well. Thank you very much. The meeting has now closed. Could you please end the broadcast? Thank you. Yes. Yes, Tony. Thanks, Chair.